Hi biologists, let's start by looking at the learning outcomes for this lesson. At the end of this section and following the biology syllabus, you should be able to define the term biology, give specific examples of areas of study encompassed by the term biology. You should also be able to understand and describe the process of the scientific method. What does this actually mean? What are we trying to understand? Well, it's straightforward enough. You have to be able to give the definition of the term biology. You also have to be able to give examples of areas of study in biology. And lastly, you have to be able to understand and describe the process of the scientific method. Let's have a look at the definition of biology. Knowing the definition of biology is a learning objective of this lesson. So make it your business to learn it. Biology is the study of living things. When you look at the actual word biology, you can see bio, which comes from the Greek word for life, and ology coming from the Greek word of knowledge. So it makes sense that biology is the knowledge or the study of living things. Now, biology is a huge subject area with many divisions and subdivisions. It's an objective of the lesson again that we should know a number of areas of study in biology. Now what I like to do here is that the areas that we pick to know are areas that we actually cover in the course and that makes life an awful lot easier because we're going to meet these definitions again. So why not have a look at the definition of microbiology. So Microbiology is the study of microorganisms, microscopic life, as you can see in the word microbiology. Genetics, another big section in the course, is the study of your genes and how you inherit characteristics from your parents. So it is the study of genes and hereditary. As you can see in the term, you can see the word gene. Now, taxonomy. Taxonomy is the study of classifying organisms and later in the course we shall be learning about how scientists classify living organisms or put them into different groups or kingdoms based on their similarities. And lastly, but not least, is ecology. Now ecology is a huge section on the course and what are we studying when we are studying ecology? Well, ecology is the study of the interactions of living organisms. In other words, how living organisms get on with each other and how they get on or adapt to their environment. Now, when scientists are working, scientists try to follow a series of procedures or a logical way of working to try and explain observations that might be made in the world. So the scientific method, it's an attempt at using, as I've said, an organized approach to solve problems. Now, it might be fine if you're an artist, not insulting anybody, you can throw paint at a canvas without maybe following an awful lot of rules and create a masterpiece. Same thing in music, perhaps you can strum out a few chords and create a best-selling song. However, in science, scientists try to follow a, a set of ground rules or a set of guidelines. They try to follow an organised approach to solve problems. It doesn't mean that scientists aren't creative, but they do try to follow a certain set of guidelines when they approach their work. Now, these guidelines basically involve asking questions. Scientists have to be observant, so they ask questions and they search for answers. So basically, they are seeking solutions to problems and using science really to discover new knowledge. 
Now, when we look at the scientific method process, it can vary from textbook to textbook or from country to country, but it is characterized or there are certain features by which you would recognize the scientific method. Here are the steps involved in the scientific method. Commencing, as we've said, with observation, hypothesis, experimentation, etc., and finishing with a principle or a law. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these steps and have a short word on each step of the process. Let's start with observation. Observations are really the most important step of the scientific method because it's all based on noticing something. So observations are really the basis for all the facts to do with the problem. Now observations are usually made directly by using your senses and your sense organs or they can be made indirectly by using equipment like microscopes and thermometers. To illustrate this, I'm going to use the idea of an imaginary apple. So as an observation, I notice, I observe, I see a rotting apple on the table and it's covered in a fluffy, furry mould or mould. Oh, so I observe the apple. I observe that it's rotten. I see that with my eyes. I can smell it with my nose. So now the second step in my scientific method is to come up with a hypothesis. Now a hypothesis really is an educated guess, basically a sensible guess as to what might have caused my observation. Now a hypothesis is a very important definition, so make it your business to learn it. Notice it's an educated guess, E-S-S, -S, and there is E-S-S -S at the end of hypothesis. So a hypothesis is an educated guess based on observations. Basically, it's a possible explanation for what you have noticed. You're predicting the answer to your question. For example, I'm trying to guess what would have caused that apple to rot? Now I have noticed there's mould on it. So a hypothesis is quite often stated in the form of an if-then statement. So in my case, if there is mould on an apple, then it will rot. So now I have a hypothesis for my observation. So what is the next step? Well, the next step is to set up an experiment to test this guess of mine. Remember, I am guessing if there is mould on an apple, then it will rot. So I have to design an experiment to test this observation and hypothesis that I've made. In another video, we will look at the steps involved in designing an experiment. When I've worked through the process, the results that I will get will either support my hypothesis or it might contradict the hypothesis. So in my example, I might find that the mould does cause the apple to rot, so then my hypothesis is supported. An experiment then basically is a test for a hypothesis. During the process of the experiment, I will be gathering data or information. In my imaginary example, does the apple rot? I will be taking note of how many days it takes to rot. So data is information that's gathered during a scientific investigation. The information or the data is collected and recorded and then has to be analysed and looked at. The scientists will look at the data to try and pick out patterns or trends and will use the data to come to a conclusion. So as I've said, the experimental data is interpreted to reach a conclusion or a result. 
and, as we've said before, the conclusion should show whether the results support or contradict the original hypothesis. So in a nutshell, a conclusion is a summary of the results of an experiment. You'd have had this experience in school when working in the lab and writing up your experiments. They should always finish with a conclusion where you summarise the results. Don't just tell the examiner to record his results and leave it at that. You must give a summary of the results that were got in the experiment. Now, you have to make sure that your conclusion or your results aren't completely off the wall. So the next step in the scientific process is to relate your conclusion to knowledge that might be already there. So in my case, for example, if I'm coming to the conclusion that the mould caused the apple to rot and I look up the internet or knowledge in that area and discover that other people have found that mould causes oranges and pears to rot, well then I will know that I'm on the right track. If my conclusion is that aliens came down during the night and caused the apple to rot, and I don't find any knowledge about that, well, then I know that I'm kind of going out in a bit of a limb here. So, the conclusion should tie in with the existing knowledge on the topic. And it's awfully important to realise that the conclusion will support your hypothesis, or it might change it, or you might wind up contradicting it or rejecting it. So if my conclusion had been that the aliens came down from space and caused the apple to rot, reading around my subject area would lead me to reject that hypothesis and come up with a new one to be tested. So this is a little cycle within the scientific method. And if the hypothesis is supported by a large number of experiments, then the hypothesis might lead to the formation of a theory. So perhaps we would have a theory of mould rotting apples theory. And then the theory eventually might lead to a law. So when I've done this work and I've come to my conclusion, I have read around the subject area, I am now ready to report and publish my results. So this is what we're doing in school. We are scientists or biologists in training. And when we write up our experiments, we are training ourselves as scientists to writing up scientific reports. So this is why we have to lay them out following a certain order and have them logical and clear and scientific. So the results are reported so that they can be examined or analyzed by others. So they can be analyzed by your teacher or if you're a professional scientist, they will be analysed or examined by other scientists. So you publish your results in journals. Journals like Nature would be a very well-known scientific journal or a journal called Science. So they can be uh, published in journals, uh, magazines, in newspapers, on the TV and on the internet. And the whole idea is that your results and your experiments can be reproduced and repeated by others. We do this in class when there might be eight groups working on the same experiment and it would be hoped that all eight groups in the biology lab would all get the same results. So if we do, then we would consider that the experiment was valid and could be proved and it was reliable. The same thing is done out in the real world. When other scientists repeat and reproduce results, the experiment is considered to be validated. The next step in the process might involve the development of a theory. Now, the definition of a theory is rather important. So again, make sure you learn it. A theory is a hypothesis. It's basically a guess, as we said at the beginning of this video. But the difference is that it has been supported by many different experiments, by many different scientists. So in a nutshell, it is an idea that's uncertain, 
but it is accepted as being the correct explanation because it is supported by so many different experiments. So in a nutshell, it is a supported hypothesis, as the definition says. Finally, we have the last step in the scientific method, which is the development of a principle. Now, a principle or a law arises from a theory that's valid, that has been tested and supported. And if this theory has been tested and supported over a long period of time, then we can tick the box, it gets a promotion, and then it might become a law. So basically, a principle or a law is a theory that has stood the test of time. It is there for a long time. It is said to be valid under all the conditions that can be tested. So we do have examples of laws that we have met already. We have Mendel's law of segregation in genetics. And there you have it. Have a method yourself. Practice in a jotter. Now that we have reached the end of our lesson, have we achieved our objective? Can you define the term biology? Can you give specific examples of areas of study encompassed by the term biology? And lastly, can you understand and describe the process of the scientific method?